So I'd like to welcome you all to the 15th annual Estes Lecture of the Boston Medical Library. I'm Rick Peters. I'm the new president of the Boston Medical Library. And I'm here to introduce Dr. Podolsky, who's going to introduce our speaker. <laughs> So it's my privilege to introduce uh, this year's SE speaker, Jeremy Green, William H. Welch Professor and Chair of the Department of the History of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Green is, of course, well known to many of you here. After completing his undergraduate and master's degrees in anthropology, he completed his MD and PhD in the history of science here in 2005, where his advisors were no less than Alan Brandt, Arthur Kleinman, and Charles Rosenberg. He completed his training in internal medicine at the Brigham I was a faculty member in the History of Science at Harvard in the Brigham's Division of Pharmacoepidemiology before moving to Johns Hopkins in 2012 for their immense gain. While we're all proud to have Dr. Green back to give this talk, I suspect that Jay Worth Estes in particular would have been particularly proud, as Dr. Green is arguably the most widely respected and influential historian of pharmaceuticals in the world today. His first monograph, Describing by Numbers, Drugs to the Definition of Disease, unpacked the manner by which the pharmaceutical industry private practitioners, and public health establishment have collectively redefined and generally expanded disease categories in the context of emerging drugs. <coughs> Rather than rendering facile claims of disease monitoring, Dr. Green mobilized extensive archival primary source evidence and comfortably incorporated insights from such disciplines as anthropology and sociology to trace the relationship between drugs and disease. Widely cited and ever more relevant to contemporary health practices, Prescribing by Numbers garnered the Rachel Carson Prize from the Society for Social Studies of Science and the Kremers Prize from the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy. Dr. Green's next single author volume, because he's got a bunch of edited volumes as well, Generic, The Branding and Unbranding of Modern Medicine, was perhaps even more ambitious. The generic industry, drug industry, has evolved from David to the Goliath over the span of half a century. Neither championing nor demonizing the industry, Dr. Green again used extensive archival and primary source data to uncover the evolution of the now massive industry, the regulatory measures that have resulted in its present status, and the implications of such history, the ecology of drug distribution and pricing. So our nation grapples with difficult questions concerning the production, pricing, and equitable distribution of pharmaceuticals. Academicians and Congress alike have turned to Dr. Green for his wisdom and ability to frame approaches to such difficult issues. Dr. Green has innovated at every step in his career, whether helping to develop the Interfaculty Initiative on Medications in Society while here, or forming the Center for the Medical Humanities and Social Medicine at Hopkins. So it's no surprise that he turned in his next present book project, Medicine at a Distance, to what seems at first glance an entirely novel series of questions concerning communication in medicine. How did the telegraph, telephone, and fax machine revolutionize medicine? What does this imply for how contemporary technologies like email and the internet will impact the patient physician encounter? What are the origins and futures of remote diagnosis and interventions? And when and how does technology cease being novel and fade into the substrate of medical de care delivery in the first place? Dr. Green is shown by his previous books and by his career itself as both a historian and practicing physician, has had a unique ability to force us to reconsider what we take for granted in our daily practice of diagnosing and treating patients. It will certainly bring the same combination of critical analysis and rigorous scholarship to his present book project. We're privileged to get a sneak peek as he speaks to us tonight on The Wired Clinic, Experimental Television, and the Media History of Medicine. What can the history of older technologies teach us about the future of digital medicine? Thank you so much, Scott, for that kind introduction. I feel like that might be the best thing that you're going to hear tonight. Um, I, I, have, I have an immense debt to, to, to Scott Podolsky, as well as helping to form a model of what a career as a physician and a historian might look like as I was trying to uh, put these things together here at Harvard, uh, you know, just not that many years ago. Um, and I, I also want to thank both Rick and Dale and Tara and the, uh, the Boston Medical Library for the immense honor of being invited here to give the Jayworth Besties lectures. It's, it's really delightful to be here today. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to talk you through a work in progress, and I'm really looking forward to where the Q&A might take us, because uh, this is a history of new media in medicine, um, which is a new subject for me, as Scott was just alluding to. 
And uh, I want to take my time today to frame a broader problem that new media has posed for health and medicine over a, a long period of time. Um, I realize I need to turn on my, my microphone as well. And this question, what are the advantages and disadvantages of new media in medicine, is, um, is, is one I've become deeply interested in. How, what happens when we begin to do medicine through communications technologies and increasingly through electronic ones that potentiate novel forms of interactions or, or conversely raise old problems in new ways and situating what we might call analog medicine, forms of older problems of doing medicine at a distance through electronic technologies can help provide some new insights into our contemporary fascination or concerns about digital medicine today. And I want to point out that there's a long history of studying media and medicine, and many social histories of television and medicine in particular have focused on the social forces involved in the production or circulation of medical and public health knowledge through televisual media. Uh, others have provided cultural histories that focus on representation of medicine, or physicians often, but sometimes science, in film and television, providing close contextual analyses and cultural histories of medicine and popular culture. One way of understanding this trend was to say, take a look at the physician and television from uh, Medic in the 1950s through the heroic ages of Drs. Kildare, Casey, and Welby in the 1960s through the more complex worlds of Quincy or the staff of St. Elsewhere, and then ER to end the 20th century with a bunch of scrubs. And no doubt, no doubt this approach is useful as a form of cultural history of, um, of the medical profession in American society. But it misses another, and I think potentially more surprising history of the kinds of medical knowledge and medical practice that television as a new media promised to audiences or to physicians or to patients at different moments in the 20th century. And it's that promise, that early affordance of what TV could do for the doctor or patient that I'd like to try and reanimate today as an exercise in thinking with new media or thinking with old media when they were new. Um, and I want to ask you today to reconsider the television as a new media. I'm particularly interested in understanding how older technologies, when they were new, were recruited in imagining the possible futures of science, medicine, and public health. Uh, as, for example, in this famous 1926 image by Fritz Kahn, a brilliant German uh, illustrator that, uh, called The Doctor of the Future. And if we look at this image, we see that this is a technologically mediated image of the practice of medicine. Um, and it is, in many ways, a form of electronic medicine. There is a board in front of the physician with the names of various patients on a ward. Uh, the visual information presents ranges from an electrocardiogram to a temperature curve to an x-ray to the blood pressure to the heart tones. And there is this communication technology of the telephone just dangling right by the right shoulder of the physician. So for me, this is part of a much broader research project that follows the introduction of earlier electrical and electronic media, including the telephone, radio, television, and also the early mainframe computer in the shaping and reshaping of health, illness, and the practice of medical care. And uh, this draws inspiration from, I think, some notable scholarship in media history, which is not always in conversation with the history of medicine. Um, I've been uh, very impressed with the work of the media historian Lisa Gittleman, who tries to emphasize, among other things, the role of thinking about media with a small m, not necessarily the media as established broadcast network or film, television, but the various different mundane ways in which we interact with various media of recording and communications in daily life. Following historians like Fred Turner and Jennifer Light, I want to emphasize the role of how technological formations help us to imagine new ways, perhaps, to solve age-old problems, potentiate new countercultural political formations, or invest seemingly liberatory possibilities of how technology might deliver us from uh, whatever political or social morass that we find ourselves in, even if these formations then go on to become site for defense contractors or aerospace contractors or large corporations to step in and solve. And so today's talk, The Wired Clinic, is a talk about two stories of television and thinking of television as a new medical media. The first will explore the work of Reba Ben Scooter at the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute. Ben Scooter is a pioneer in the fields of television medicine and biomedical communications in the late 50s and 1960s, and her papers are preserved in the National Library of Medicine. She envisioned, as I'll explain shortly, 
how to begin working with what Marshall McLuhan would later call the cool media of television in the late 1950s and make it by the later 60s, in my own clunky terms, even cooler. The second episode turns to Kenneth Byrd's experimental field station at Logan Airport. Um, and just because we are here at a meeting of the Boston Medical Library, how many of you are familiar with the clinic that, that the Mass General Hospital ran? Here's the show of hands. Oh, fantastic. So I'm, I'm hoping to learn more from you during the Q&A today. Um, now, this clinic is a site for producing those televised conjunctiva that formed the basis of the poster outside. Now, this is a, experiment, a series of experiments that took place from the late 1960s to the early 1970s. Before, I'll then conclude bring the two stories together and draw some conclusions about how we think about new media in projecting various futures of medicine today. But first, Reba Ben Scooter. In early 1966, Dr. Reba Ben Scooter found herself in the middle of an audience of luminaries at the New York Academy of Medicine for a multi day conference on the role of new media in medicine. As the conference host, James Lieberman, noted in his introduction to the event, quote, just as seven out of 10 prescriptions written today are for items unknown to medicine before World War II, seven out of 10 possibilities for communicating that knowledge behind those prescriptions were not available before 1946. Lieberman was head of the Atlanta-based Public Health Service Audiovisual Faculty, the National Medical Audiovisual Center, which he described to the audience as a new younger sibling to the National Library of Medicine in Bethesda. Quote, what the library does for the printed word, he said, the, print, the Public Health Service Audiovisual Facility does for the visual image. Lieberman had assembled some 40 speakers from academia, industry, and government, including advertising executives right off Madison Avenue, the heart surgeon Michael DeBakey beamed live on a giant TV screen, the National Library of Medicine director Marty Cummings, and the governor of American Samoa. Uh, American Samoa had recently shifted its approach to secondary school education to a model which used a standardized television curriculum. And all of them followed, perhaps, the convention already popularized by the Canadian historian of communication, Harold Innes, and amplified by his countryman, Marshall McLuhan, who had by 1967 already been recognized as a rock star of popular media studies. And this conference began with a history of different forms of media for medical communication, from the spoken word to the printed word, to the phonograph, telephone, film strip, and radio. But as in McLuhan's work in the 60s in general, the television took center stage at this conference. In part, this was in recognition of the greater interactivity the television allowed. Relating to McLuhan's classic distinction between hot media and cool media, and hot media to McLuhan, like film and radio, were those that engaged one sense entirely and made the viewer or listener into a passive recipient, uh, much like this lecture, perhaps. But cool media, like television, engaged several senses less completely and required more interaction on the part of the user. Most of the speakers at the conference focused on the value of television as a medium for medical education. And indeed, if you look through medical journals at this time for television, you find a lot written about how the TV can be used as an educational tool. Um, the NIH had funded a, a Council of Medicine, Medical Television in 1959 that focused almost exclusively on this subject, TV and medical education. But, and Ben Scoder had begun her career thinking about communication technologies and medical education. Um, and not just television, but also telephones as a medium for health science education. Um, this is a, a pamphlet from an earlier uh, production at, at Kansas, Professor in Absentia, and this is showing the use of a telephone as a means for professors to uh, you know, give their lectures at a, difference, at a distance. Those of you who have taught classes know the days that you feel that you phoned in a lecture, and it's not thought of as a positive anymore, but here, this was seen as an exciting potential that the telephone could bring to, uh, to ed pedagogical technologies. Um, now, when Ben Scoder was hired in 1957 to join the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute's effort to integrate services with the Norfolk Mental Hospital, more on that soon, she began to think critically about the new use of the television as an even more interactive medium than perhaps McLuhan would later state. Specifically, Ben Scoder became interested in the new technology of closed circuit TV and cable linkages um, to place a camera and a television both in two locations and create a televisual loop between two facilities. And what would ultimately become a connection between the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute in, um, in Omaha, Nebraska, and the Norfolk Mental Hospital was also part of her partnership with Dr. Cecil Whitson, who is the professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and the head of the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute. 
Now, Whitson had, had very positive experiences introducing telephone consultations in the practice of psychiatry and had written quite a bit about what the telephone could do to extend the reach of a relatively small number of psychiatrists covering the breadth of the state of Nebraska and thought that with the creation of a closed circuit television, um, visual elements could further enhance the ability to teach, diagnose, and treat mental health. Now with Ben Scoder's assistance, Whitson designed a basic setup of television and camera linked by cable to another television and camera. And it was first tested just across the street in Omaha between the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute and the An Anatomy Building, right, right adjacent. First it was used for teaching, then later for Kroll controlled experiments testing the ability to conduct a detailed neurological exam when directing a person over a tele television. And then later for therapeutic functions, especially group psychotherapy, bringing the television camera dyad into play. With a proof of concept in hand, Whitson and Ben Scoder uh, applied to the NIH to test the practicality of this new interactive medium. And um, specifically to open up a link between the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute and the Norfolk Mental Hospital 112 miles away. And when in 1964 the first link between these two facilities was opened, the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute ran the first large-scale test of interactive television as a way to conduct medical practice. Now, Ben Scoder reported to her colleagues at this conference, the New York Academy of Medicine, that the principal benefit was thought to be educational still, maintaining a link for the residents rotating through the hospital at Norfolk to receive better instruction from their mentors locally and at a distance, holding joint grand rounds, instituting a calendar of telelectures. But a surprising element for Ben Scoder came in unanticipated dimensions of patient care and patient services. So for example, Norfolk didn't have a neurologist on staff at the mental hospital. But Dr. Dutch in Omaha could, quote, sit down in front of his camera and monitor at NPI and get to work. Early research showed, quote, it was possible to observe reasonably detailed neurological examinations on TV, and EEGs could be read quite easily using inexpensive equipment. More unexpected yet was the response of patients. 43% of hospitalized patients in Norfolk were actually from urban Omaha. But many family members were unable to visit due to distance and transportation and logistical issues. Ben Scoder opened a viewing station at the, National Psych at, the, at the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute in Omaha eight hours a week for family members to be able to communicate in real time with their loved ones in Norfolk. Um, these TV visits, she later noted, played an important role in keeping the absent member in the family. But this new media also offered capabilities for the bureaucratic management of ward life. The 27 wards of the state hospital were run by three staff psychiatrists, which some had critiqued as creating a carceral, quote, ward for the hopeless, um, which had largely replaced a therapeutic impulse at the state mental hospital. This is not a story unique to uh, Norfolk Mental Hospital at this point in time. It was a widespread critique of many state mental institutions at the time. And yet, uh, Ben Scoder lingers on this point in her presentation. With interactive television, Ben Scoder and Whitson added regular rounds on each ward with psychiatrists back in Omaha. And today, she concluded, success of the project can be seen in the unlocked doors, the changed staff attitudes, the patient participation in hospital therapy and work programs, and the appearance of the ward itself with its freshly painted furniture and new curtains. Now, this is a lot to attribute to, to television, but it does suggest that of the many ways of interpreting how mental health care changes in this time period, that communications technologies could be recruited into creating a, a therapeutic potential. Um, now, as the total inpatient population of the hospital then dropped during this time period from more than 900 people uh, in 1965 to 476 by the end of 1968, and those of you that know the history of psychiatric deinstitutionalization in the United States will understand that this is still a very complex social reality um, whose impacts are still very much being felt. Nonetheless, the group in Omaha took this as evidence of therapeutic success of creating televisual networks, which created a greater sense of therapeutic possibility. And although Ben Scoder did notice some reluctance, more on the part of staff than on patients, all in all, the system had remarkably few technical glitches. And uh, by, by the log accounts, there seemed to be only 24 hours of downtime of this system 
over the five years that it is funded and operational. And so by the time the project funding ended in 1970, the system was still being used actively 45 to 50 hours per week. As Whitson later noted in an interview, quote, it had a great symbolic effect. The Nebraska Psychiatric Institute became more a part of the state system than any similar institution I know of. As one result, Nebraska may well become the first state to do away with state mental hospitals. So I'm going to take us now back to Boston. But first, you've listened to me a while already. And I want to give you a moment to enjoy this meditative slide. Um, Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was a little preview there. Um, uh, this is a slide which shows a, uh, a murmuration of starlings. And I have to say, this is still one of my favorite words in the English language. You see, it's murmuration. It almost evokes with its syllables this quality of um, uh, biomorphic shapes, uh, how, how parts in a whole can evoke each other uh, almost seamlessly and through ways that we don't quite comprehend. Very pleasing to watch at a distance aesthetic and soothing, but of course far more terrifying from up close. Um, on the morning of April 4, October 4, 1960, a murmuration of starlings flew into the engine of an Electra turboprop plane that was taking off from Boston's Logan Airport, and that caused it to stall and collapse in the shallow waters of Winthrop Bay. And although many of the passengers died on impact, a number of casualties initially survived, but died later due to delays in medical attention. These are potentially uh, preventable casualties. As radio stations relayed the location of the disaster there in Winthrop Bay, hundreds of spectators took to the roads to witness the spectacle, uh, unintentionally blocking the passage of emergency vehicles on key ro roadways in the process. And ambulances from Massachusetts General Hospital, this, this map is unnecessary for this audience. Um, but you will notice it's less than three miles away. Nonetheless, arrived too late to help many of those who initially survived the crash. And in the aftermath of this tragedy, the director for the Massachusetts Port Authority reached out to then head of the Massachusetts General Hospital, John Knowles, to build a quote unquote miniature hospital in Logan to respond to future emergencies of the sort. Now, the resulting field station of MGH would unexpectedly become a laboratory for the invention of television medicine. And the birth, as far as I can tell, of the phrase telemedicine that we use very broadly today. And the story of this clinic is preserved in the MGH archives and in the collected papers of its first director, Ken Bird, Kenneth Bird, a young internist with interest in pulmonary and cardiovascular medicine. After the Logan Medical Station opened at gate 23 in 1963, Bird's thoughts turned increasingly towards the role of communication technologies in healthcare. Bird and a colleague staffed the clinic between, during peak commuting hours at 8 to 10 a.m. and 4 to 6 a.m. But during the remainder of the time, they helped to staff the clinic on telephone call by pager, um, working with a highly qualified set of nurses, of nurse practitioners, who staffed the clinic on a 24-hour basis. And so in many ways, one story of this clinic is a story of how it, initially the telephone became a basis of allowing autonomy of nurse practitioners to be tested and then therefore authorized and legitimized in a particularly controlled context. You may recall this is a very important time for the formation of nurse practitioners and increasingly autonomous practice. But the limitations of medicine by telephone soon became apparent. One of our first patients, Bird later recalled, quote, was an elderly woman who had injured her hip. The medical station nurse telephoned me a full report of the woman's symptoms, but I just couldn't be sure of the diagnosis. Despite all of our efforts, I had to face the fact that a verbal report just wasn't enough in a situation like this. If only I could see the patient, I thought. There was no choice but to bring the woman by ambulance to the hospital to determine how extensively she was hurt. But of course, he continued, I could see patients at a distance. If I could see a space launch a thousand miles away in Florida and hear an astronaut's heartbeat a thousand miles up in space, then there was no reason why a patient a few miles away couldn't be seen and have his vital signs checked while a nurse led him through a physical examination. Bird sought to stretch the diagnostic capacity of the urgent care nurse by adding interactive television to the trauma setting and to use his field station as a laboratory for studying electronic media and medicine. And with a three-year grant from the United States Public Health Service, he was able to set up a line of sight microwave transmission pathway between these two sites and hook up equipment to produce a continuous audio-visual loop. 
So closed circuit TVs were equipped with a range of cameras for long shots and close-ups and physical examination. Other specialized cameras could transmit x-rays, EKGs, and video microscopy of blood smears. And all of this information was fed into the console of the physician back at the main hospital in a special alcove tucked off of the emergency department. So when the clinic opens in April of 1968, it's, there's great fanfare. The Boston Globe reports, quote, the doctors are never more than a few feet away from their patients, even though the latter are at the airport and the doctors are at the hospital downtown. Or alternately, as a third year medical student at Harvard Medical School, r rotating through the clinic described it, in Bird's clinic, quote, the doctor's stethoscope is three miles long. Now, if this imagery of telepresence evokes a form of science fiction in the present, it was no accident. The medical student in question, Michael Crichton, was already a celebrated science fiction author. Just a year earlier, his first novel, The Andromeda Strain, had been published to critical acclaim and option as a blockbuster movie in the new genre of biomedical thriller. Yet Crichton was already at work on a second book, Five Patients, which devoted a chapter to the science fiction already present in the contemporary practice of the medical station at Gate 23. Now, like Crichton, Bird saw his clinic as a form of science fiction in the present, too. He described his jet-setting patient population as denizens of the future. Quote, we have always viewed the 5,000 employee population of the airport as a prototype of one community of the future, heavily dependent upon radio communication, aware of the value of electronic aircraft aids, accustomed to the daily use of closed circuit television as currently used for flight schedule information. This community, he, he concluded, is already convinced of the value of applied electronics and thus has set its own stage for the acceptance of medical electronics. And television was the central technology in Bird's vision of a future of telemedicine. He's quite likely the first physician to quote a media theorist in grant applications, although I can't prove that. He noted in a 1970 proposal in which he coined the term telemedicine that as McLuhan had claimed, quote, time has ceased, space has vanished, we now live in a simultaneous happening. Ours is a brand new world of all onceness. Um, Burb was also fond of quoting McLuhan on how broadcast television, broadcast television is a form of cool media permits an intense commitment and has become, quote, the most recent and spectacular electrical extension of our central nervous system. But he thought McLuhan didn't go far enough and chided McLuhan for ignoring the unidirectional limitation of broadcast television. Interactive cable, in contrast, permitted a dynamic interaction which allows interpersonal communication across distance to recreate and even enhance face-to-face -face communication. Quote, when an interactive television system is augmented with medical diagnostic and monitoring instrumentation, a telemedicine circuit emerges. And so, again, if TV was a cool medium for Bird, television medicine, telemedicine offered something even cooler. Now, I want to point out that, that Bird's archive is full of details regarding the concern of fidelity, of how one could be sure that the, the ability to diagnose and treat mediated televisually would not introduce problematic errors into either part of this process. And he saw that this mediation of medicine by television is having perils as well as promise. So you'll know these are black and white pictures. And even though color television is available at the time, Bird and his technical collaborator, the CBS engineer Stanley Cranin, preferred black and white, as Bird was concerned that a poor color picture would lead to erroneous patient assessment or diagnosis. And except in dermatology or some forms of pathology, Bird and Cranin argued that color was not relevant to medicine. Um, if a doctor could see a lesion on the blood vessels of an eye in person, would that same lesion be visible to another doctor looking at that eye on a TV screen several miles away? These are the kinds of questions that mattered. The image above here, um, from one of many reports in Bird's files, shows photographs. You have to walk with me through here. Walk with me through this here because this is a heavily mediated image. I mean, right now you're seeing a projection, of course, of a keynote slide that I've already digitized on my computer. But it is of a photograph, um, a pair of photographs of television screens, which themselves depict images of the conjunctiva of a model patient at two different camera settings. And these images constituted the corpus of Bird and Cranin's exhaustive experiments to pr prove what I would call a science of similarity for televisual diagnosis, a process Bird called teleognosis. And again, Cranin and Bird went on to assay the visual capacities and limitations of different lenses and video enhancement algorithms um, to distinguish key features on microscopic, radiological, or physical examinations as well. 
But apart from these technical questions of fidelity and equivalence and diagnostic confidence, Bird's telediagnostic clinic also encountered a degree of skepticism by patients and practitioners. And Bird's papers at MGH is preserved. Um, I only found one piece of doggerel. I, I tend to look for doggerel wherever I can find it as a historian. But this piece is on Logan Medical Station's letterhead, presumably inspired by the 1965 Rolling Stones hit. I can't get no satisfaction. It's settled. I don't want no telemedicine. And I'm not going to sing it for you today, although <laughs> I can invite you to do so afterwards. But I'll read you a few lines. I, I don't want no telemedicine. I don't want no doctor's smile flashing on a television over any span of miles. I don't want no diagnosis with a 1500 lens. I don't want no eye exam with a camera focused in. I don't want no doctor peering down my throat from miles away. I don't want nobody listening to my heart on microwave. And I, I don't know who authored this. Um, but these echoes of Big Brother notwithstanding, and one can find echoes of Big Brother in the images that Bird chose to represent the telediagnostic clinic as well. Bird's telemedical field station was widely considered a success in the works of its nurse practitioners and medical staff, in the accounts of patients that I can find from the time, and as an engine for producing publication after publication about the value and fidelity of medicine practice through a television. Um, when John Knowles, who was the head of MGH, who helped to establish this original clinic, when he left MGH in 1971 to become head of the Rockefeller Foundation, he took with him Bird's vision of television medicine as a form of community medicine of the future. One of the first reports that Knowles has commissioned during his tenure as, as head of the Rockefeller Foundation is, uh, is a report, an introduction to telemedicine, interactive television for delivery of health services. And it situated the Logan Television Clinic as an early step towards a new era of telemedical primary care in a world newly linked by interactive cable televisions, a technological solution to geographical disparities in access to health care. The Rockefeller Report suggested that modular telemedical clinics could be built in all underserved medical areas so that no American would be without access to primary, secondary, and tertiary care. And here, in, um, like, uh, if you couldn't get doctors to everyone who needed them, you could get cameras and telemetry devices to them. So by 1974, Rockefeller could point to 11 new active demonstration projects currently underway, influenced by Bird's findings and funded by federal grants from the United States Public Health Service, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the, the National Science Foundation, and even NASA. This report comes from a NASA-funded project, which, again, I could discuss more fully in the Q&A. Um, and I want to point out that these projects all envisioned the, the mobilization of televisual technologies as a quick solution to these enduring problems of, uh, of, dis of grave disparities in health that are produced along social as well as physical uh, geographies in the United States. And if you trace the different uh, pilot projects that are funded, that are listed in the Rockefeller Report, you learn, you learn as much about the social imagination of what are relevant disparities to be solved with technology as you do about the technological impulse to solve them. And I guess here's a, just a question for you as an audience. If you try and put your, yourself in the mindset of a, of a group of people with health, education, and welfare funding this work in the early 1970s, where might you deploy? Where might you expect to find these television circuits deployed? What forms of social geography, what barriers would they thought to be able to overcome? In Appalachia, they had a medical team that In Appalachia, so certainly. So this, so in this idea of, and, App, and just to broaden from Appalachia general, this idea that that for rural health disparities and. One way also gloss even further is actually to, is to bring discussions of race in as well and think of them as white rural regions, right, or populations. I don't, not, not exclusively, but you also, you certainly see a project that is funded at Dartmouth, which is intended specifically to use these technologies to bring broader access to healthcare to, uh, to, to rural New England populations as well. Yeah, so uh, other social geographies that you might think this, these circuits would be applied to. So inner cities, I'm for some reason having a hard time locating. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. So certainly, and, and there, there, are, there are two projects. And of course, inner city in this moment of social imaginaries is also co coded 
not exclusively black, sometimes it's quoted African American and Latino, but it's certainly a racialized imagination of, of what the inner city is. And so there's a project that deploys, uh, that deploys, deploys telemedical circuits funded by, the, the grant goes to Mount Sinai to use these technologies to overcome barriers of access in Harlem. Uh, there's another grant that goes to the University of Chicago to overcome barriers of access in the south side of Chicago, very much understood in, in urban and racialized terms as well. And rather than, I, I mean, my, my hunch is that if you went a few more rounds, you would, you would ultimately guess all of them. But there are similar projects that are deployed in, um, in, uh, in uh, northern Alaska um, for delivering care to Alaskan natives, uh, in the, on the Papago Reservation on southern Arizona, thinking about rural Native American spaces. Um, the Miami-Dade Correctional Center, so the use of these circuits to deliver care to carceral populations and the island territory of Puerto Rico um, with the, this idea that, that telemedicine would actually help to be a way of, of building up infrastructure where healthcare infrastructure had, had been languished in, in, the, in the Caribbean. And so even though all of these programs turned out like birds stationed at Gate 23 to be technical successes, by the early 1980s, every federally funded experiment in achieving healthcare equity if that wasn't the term they used, it still is something that resonates with contemporary drives of using technologies to achieve healthcare equity. Every one of these, although they had all been technically proficient in demonstrating their, their, their success, um, had wrapped up shop, uh, their funding had dried up, and they had stopped operating. And so in short, most of these dreams for healthcare equity through new communications technologies have yet to be realized, although they were spelled out very explicitly in terms of equity and social justice at the in, in the early 70s. And yet some of the more mundane applications of these technologies, some of the more mundane visions for what they might do were realized. Uh, in, in this 1966 uh, New York Academy of Sciences Conference um, on Media and Medicine, which I, which I used to begin this lecture, one hospital director noted, quote, in the world of tomorrow, we will be able to communicate by television as readily as we now communicate by telephone. By 1990, he predicted, everyone would carry a picture gun in their pocket, which would allow them to be readily record images and sounds anytime, anywhere. This masterpiece of miniaturization will be electronic and will carry its own power supply, will record both still and motion pictures in color, and will be totally self-adjusting for both exposure and focus. Now, doubtless many of you have some form of picture gun in your pocket today. You, you may not be using it to visualize teeth in quite as exemplary a, a, a manner. Um, uh, or some of you may be taking notes on some equivalent of the personal viewer of the future he foresaw, even if your votes may not, your notes may not have to do with teeth. Um, he, he was an orthodontist. Um, it is often hard for us to know moving forwards which technological visions will come to pass and which will not. And this is what I want to linger on in this comparison of the technical success but logistical and political failures of the telemedical experiments of the early 70s and the corresponding unanticipated successes of what seemed like utopian dreams of, of laptops and, and smartphones at the time. So it's very hard for us to know moving forwards which technological visions will come to pass and which will not. Um, that doesn't stop us from continuing to imagine in breathless terms how the problems of the present day can be solved with new media technologies. Last year, for example, the prototype models of the Tricorder X Prize went into consumer testing. Um, many of you will know about the Tricorder X Prize. It received a lot of press. Um, a competition aimed to create a more functional um, version of, uh, of, of effectively a, a, uh, an app-based um, uh, telemedical device. Um, evocative of the technology of Star Trek doctors from bones to crusher. A prototype of a home medical interface that could perform an expanded suite of diagnostic functions. And so there were 312 original entrants narrowed down to seven finalists, resulted in a single winner which could check all the boxes on the functions that were desired. And the dream of the Tricorder X Prize, like that of television medical suites in the 1970s, were framed as a form of science fiction in the present. Again, very explicitly so. Like the medical television, if the new Tricorder catches on after its launch, it will no doubt change the nature of aspects of medical work, but it's not at all clear how. And if the history I've related is any guide, the mere demonstration that quality care can be delivered through such a new technology or that barriers to access can be surmounted by them does not mean that it will necessarily on its own serve to reduce the real practical barriers to care that 
so many of our patients face in the present day. Now, I've given you two stories today. I could give you many more. This is part of a much broader history I'm writing, as Scott noted so eloquently in the introduction, about how electronic media shape medical knowledge, medical practice, and the promise of extending the benefits of modern medicine to all who can benefit from it. Um, sorry, that's a, that's a media lag. I'll, I'll conclude by noting that modern medicine has been living with promises of science fiction for decades, if not for centuries. Excavating these past visions of the future and examining which hopes and fears surrounding older technologies when they were new have come to pass and which have not offers the chance to help distinguish which of the promises of new medical media are likely to turn from science fiction to science reality and which of them are likely to remain illusory. Um, in short, I'm asking us to revision, to, to revise and revisit the role of television as a medical technology um, not merely as a vehicle of content, but as a thing that for a time afforded new visions of possible medical and public health practice. Many of these were noble visions, even if they did not come to pass. And it does us well to remember them as we speculate on future applications of the new media we are so constantly suspended in today. Thanks so much for your attention today. I'm happy to take some questions. Yes? Um, telemedicine is definitely happening in the United States. Okay. But what I'm saying is that it's not a straight line. And so there was a moment of enthusiasm for telemedicine, um, which I would argue began in these 1950s works, especially in Nebraska. And I think Ben Scooter's work is, is really under-recognized and um, got a name telemedicine in the, in the Logan Station um, you know, under the work of Kenneth Byrd and others, and then expanded into a platform in the 70s that seemed very promising. And I want to point out that in the 70s, this was a series of publicly funded pilots, right? In many ways, sort of a, a later a, a vestige of a great society platform with a lot of resonance towards thinking about the role of community health centers, how one builds, how one thinks about medicine as, as a, and, and, and the extension of healthcare as a key later push of, of, a, of a great society project. But then, then that does not continue in a straight line to in the present day. There's a collapse and a regrowth. And what I would say is where telemedicine has come from lately, um, although it rests on many of the materials, you know, consciously cited or not, that, was that I discussed in this talk, takes its place from a very different funding model and oftentimes has very different social goals that are accompanied with it um, that don't can't be placed exactly on this broad public commons promise that was made in the early 70s. That's a long answer, but does that help? Yeah, it, like, I, I study medicine in Canada, and we use telehealth all the time. Yes. I, I think it's like our world is much more remote than American. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we talk to patients on the phone, but you are know, eight hours away by plane. Like, it's not that kind of, but like, really, really far. You can't drive there. There's no roads, and it's all protocol there, so we have to communicate with patients. Yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's a, I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're bringing this up. And I, I'm, I'm also glad to hear that your experiences with it have been so positive. I, I would say that, that right now, I think we're in a moment in, in, in healthcare practice in the United States in which telemedicine has achieved a seemingly inevitable place. And so I wouldn't try to argue at all that telemedicine is not happening and that it's not here in the United States. Nor would I argue that none of the work in telemedicine that, that was done in the 60s or 70s had any impact in the communities that were trying to be served. But what I'm tracing here is more a way in which uh, a framework that was very hopefully sketched out in the United States um, was sort of allowed a moment to flex wings and then collapsed um, and has taken on different trajectories in other places. Yeah. Yes? Where sort of uh, used to the speed. Speed with which uh, technology moves into the clinic or moves into the cultural setting and yet it's remarkable that um, much of what you've described was 50 years ago. Um, and here we are uh, still wondering, as you wonder about what is the role or where is the role uh, and how much 
telemedicine will proceed. So the question that I have is for you is what are the what do you think the barriers have been? What have been the challenges to the acceptance of these concepts into the clinic and culture? That, that's a fantastic question. So to trace what are the what have been the barriers of acceptance of this concept? I the structure of this talk um, rests on a principle that a, a substantial series of barriers were were economic and were. Um, but that's not the only basis of why these systems did not continue to, to develop into the, this vast network of tele, television-mediated uh, you know, community health care that was envisioned in the Rockefeller Report in the early 70s. Um, certainly, many physicians were hesitant about employing these systems in their own practice. So one of the problems you have looking at the series of pilot studies is that they are conducted by those physicians who happen to be very enthusiastic about the prospect of what could be done through televisually mediated medicine. So Bird can't be relied on as simply a typical physician, as I suggested somewhat jokingly in his use of, of media theory and grant applications. There is an enthusiasm that he had for this subject. I think um, beyond what we might see are as some, perhaps some cultural hesitations or, or even professional formations that might lead American physicians to, to, to be hesitant. Um, there's a set of concerns of the, the investment in the infrastructure that was required to set up these systems at that time. So part of your question is, well, what's changed? And I think if we were to look at the amount of physicians who are in private practice as individuals in the year 2019 compared to the amount that were in private practice, the percentage in private practice as individuals, in 1969, when, when Bird is articulating some of these materials, that's a, that, that has been a sea change in that half century. And in fact, if we look at the role of electronic health records um, in hel helping to actually push individual physicians into group practices, right, into larger networks or out of private practice today, um, there, there's a very important structural transformation there as well. So there's a, Clearly, I can't fully answer that question here without giving another talk, and that's not what any of you want me to do right now. But I would say there, there are economic, there are cultural, there are political, right? And what seems to be much less important is actually um, the evidence of patient rejection of these technologies, right? I haven't found much evidence of that as I've moved forward. I found more I've either, either cultural and political hesitance and then economic um, concern and then structural barriers to their incorporation among among providers. Yeah. Yes. As telemedicine. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It should be on already. I'm sorry. As telemedicine separates the physician from the patient. Mm -hmm. Great separation. Are you concerned at all, or have you received any feedback about devaluating the patient-doctor relationship? Yeah. So th that's a great question. And, and, and it comes up often. And that, that comes up in, in this June 1974 report. Um, it, Bird, among others, argued that telemedicine would enhance doctor-patient relationships. And, Part of his point was that by potentiating it, as, as um, we have to put ourselves in this moment again, in, in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a concern for a doctor shortage in a sense that physicians need to find, there's so, there's so many more increasing tasks of medicine to do on a day-to-day -day basis. The ability to mobilize, again, with this language of the time of, of a mid-level practitioner, so mobilizing nurse practitioners, mobilizing physician assistants, to be able to take part in many of the, uh, you know, in, in, in a lot of the broader work of the primary care visit would, in theory, allow the physician and the patient to have more time to talk about what really mattered. So that in Bird's argument, television created an augmented physician who was able to more efficiently use their time to talk about, um, you know, to, to focus on the existential elements of a doctor-patient relationship. There are a number of, um, of publications that come out of this time of 
sorts of conversations that become possible at a distance that are harder to have in person as, as well. But one part of the reason I took us back to this slide is uh, um, Ben Park, who is at NYU um, at the Alternate Media Center. He's a fascinating figure in his own right. He's the author of this report. Um, so Park cobbled together a group of medical sociologists to talk about exactly this question. And there's extensive transcripts as part of this report. He brought in uh, Irving Goffman and um, uh, Elliot Friedson. And they talked explic explicitly about that. Goffman was very concerned about how, what happened when part of a patient's body went in or out of a frame, or how patients were concerned about how, what would happen when a part of a physician's body went in or out of a frame. And the, the term that was developed in this report was called proxemics. So, how do you develop a way of thinking about the elements of telepresence that allows someone to feel close to you even when they're at quite a distance? And those of you who have Skyped with grandparents or grandchildren uh, you know, will, will, will very much know that, um, that, that the, the trickiness of there. I think we've all had times when we feel very distant through these forms of tele, televisually mediated presence and times when we feel very close. And they actually worked quite a bit to articulate almost the possibility of a science of proxemics, how you can build those relationships into the way you design the systems. Uh, yes. Oh, thank you very much for this intriguing talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the record keeping aspect of this, both of these projects. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, how these records were preserved, if, if at all, and um, what intention the uh, physicians might have in preserving these records for future study? Yes, so, so that's, that's a great question about, about materials and methods and what do we do with the archive as we inherit it? Because the archive is, tends to be curated, right? Um, so I, I think that um, part of the way, and, and again, I would mention this is still a work in progress, part of the way that I'd like to move beyond the archive as was both collected institutionally by Mass General Hospital and by Kenneth Byrd himself, and Byrd has unfortunately um, passed away and I have been unable to speak with him, is been to, I've been working to track down the nurse practitioners that worked in this clinic. Um, I have yet to, I've always been a little bit behind, I feel, when I find someone, they've often just passed away. And this is one of the challenges of oral history. But part of my hope today is that someone in the audience might, might know one of them. <laughs> but but you, you never know. This, is, this has been a useful method for me in, in other projects is to actually give talks on works in progress and learn who, learn who was there. Um, but uh, it, it is, uh, other sources include you know, using, using popular media using newspaper records, using other forms. But it is a challenge as you're getting. So that this is something which was presented and very much showcased as a blindingly new and you know, very dazzling thing that MGH was doing. And so we have to think critically through that archive. Um, with Ben Scooter, she's, she donated papers to the National Library of Medicine and also at, at the University of um, Nebraska Medical Center. And uh, I had a very productive set of trips to the archives in, in Omaha. And I've also been able to do oral histories with, with Ben Scooter and with some of, her, um, some of her colleagues. But does that help get at your answer methodologically? So were the actual films recorded? Oh, oh, I was just thinking about this the other day. Um, I can't answer that question. Um, I could understand why they may not have been for reasons of, of privacy and confidentiality. Um, in my mind, I can imagine that there may be a room somewhere with, 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 you know, audiovisual documentation that I could look at, but I haven't found it yet. I have a question. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm interested in unintended consequences. So, just getting back to the media, is the message kind of thing. Uh, media transmits some information, but not all of it. And so, when you're using a particular medium, there are things that the mind fills in. And so it's entirely possible for a doctor and patient to have an interaction, and they're getting to different places because of what their minds are filling in. I'm wondering with all of these trials that have occurred, whether there was any um, uh, compilation of unintended consequences or side effects, or from the point of view of uh, particular diagnoses or procedures that are more suited for telemedicine versus others that are particularly risky. Yeah, no, that, that's a, it's a very important question. Um, and I, I can answer that question a, a bit more clearly for the telephone than I can for the television. And, and that, that there's a, there's, as the 
television enters medicine, as a telephone enters medicine, there's sort of, and in, 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 on a slightly earlier time frame, there's analogous enthusiasm, um, sort of, an, uh, but, but the telephone becomes a bit more omnipresent on, uh, than, than, than televisions do in clinics, right, in terms of the, the, the way that this, that history develops. One then does find a series of writings about medical malpractice that involve telephones, and then a series of warnings to physicians. Um, and, and then, as many of you will know, a key element of telephone medicine today, although we don't think of it as something particularly new, um, is knowing when the telephone is not enough, right? So you're, you talk to a patient on the phone as a practitioner, and at a certain moment, you know, you will say, well, okay, well, you can, you know, let's double the dose of your Lasix and see how you're doing. At other moments, you will say, um, I think you really need to be seen today. And it's often in that language, you need to be seen, it's the visual. In theory, the telemedical linkage would take care of that. And yet understanding that middle zone where if, you th if you're worried as a practitioner that someone is sick and needs to be seen, that seen often involves something more than that extension of a, tele of, of, of a television screen itself. Now, I mean, as is the case in, in, in the description that you're making about working in, um, were you discussing uh, British Columbia in particular? What, what location? Manitoba. Manitoba, yeah. So, yeah. And so I, I've looked into a, an, an analogous project that is, takes place in Alaska in the, in the, in the 1970s, w which began with the ATS-1 satellite and then, then moved on to the ATS-6 satellite. And the ATS-1 satellite could actually allow reliable voice communication to health outposts. And it was seen as an extraordinary development over what had occurred before. But the ATS-6 satellite was then developed expressly to to bring visuals in. And what's odd is that the ATS-6 satellite, by bringing in the visuals, raised more concerns um, in, in a sense that there, it's almost somewhat more ambiguous what the results of being able to add those visuals were at that moment in time um, than, than what it was to be able to use voice as well. Um, but this is just to say that, yes, it's, this is a, it's a, you find this as an omnipresent concern. The question is, what is it that I might not be able to detect, but I might not be able to detect that I can't detect it? It's sort of an unknown, unknown quality within telemedicine that, that lurks at the edge and becomes part of, is a way in which the, the media itself becomes incorporated into this ineffable quality of judgment. Yeah. Alicia? Thank you. Of med so the triad of medicine, technology, and then funding, how these, those three work together. So it's sort of a two-part question. First of all, were, so the um, initial efforts to use telemedicine, were they pushing the technology, or the, was the medical use of this technology just adopting existing but rather new technology for a medical purpose, or was the medicine also pushing the technology itself to be used in a slightly, you know, was it pushing the technology in a certain direction? That is, was it, there was sort of feedback on both mm -hmm. sides? Mm -hmm. And then I thought it was really interesting that you described the um, Rockefeller efforts as experiments and that then they sort of fizzled out because they were perceived to be, that they hadn't worked in a way. And I was wondering if this is partially technology related, that the technology was no longer shiny and new and it therefore wasn't as innovative, or was it that there just wasn't a better health outcome. So how much is technology driven and how much is outcome driven? That's a, that's a great pair of questions. Thanks, thanks for this. Um, so for the first question, is it driven by, is it medicine looking to the technology for results? Or is it a sense of the technology looking to medicine as a place where its, its social role can be made manifest? Or both kind of interacting together? I mean, the safe answer is always both. But I actually think it differs a bit depending on the technological platform we're talking about. So if I could, again, digress out from this talk towards thinking about the computer. If the, the last section of, of this book project looks at the mainframe computer and how this, the early computer was imagined as a, as a tool that would open up all kinds of new possibilities of how medicine would be practiced. And, and there one actually sees not only the technology, but also the firms behind the technology actively pursuing um, uh, medical frameworks in which to validate the social role of this technology. And so IBM um, gives a bunch of IBMs to prominent medical centers. And 
asks people to do interesting things with him, and then asks them all, if you don't mind, would you come back to Poughkeepsie and you know, once a year, and we'll have a conference. And to the historian, those conferences are a fantastic record. So we had this called the IBM Medical Symposium that exists every year, you know, from 1958 on for you know, a little more than a decade. And it evolves over time, and the, 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 the people argue about what, the, there's different thoughts about what the computer should do. You get to know these participants and the way in which they agree or disagree. But it's clear that, uh, that not just the computer, but IBM is actually very much behind, uh, not exclusively, but ha has a, a large role in helping this happen. Um, with, with telemedicine, it really seems to have come from, you know, again, Ben Scooter and Bird didn't seem to be too aware of each other at the time. They met each other later. Uh, independently came up with the same idea, which is that this new affordance of closed circuit TV, or in particular cable, and again, I would point out that cable television, and some of you may remember this, cable television was greeted with an enthusiasm that seems analogous to, to nothing except perhaps the internet, when you know, the early emergence of the internet, this interactive electronic communication technology that was decentralized and in which users could actually control the flow of information. And so I actually think that was much less driven by a particular central producer or manufacturer um, than by people within medicine and the healthcare field seeing a potential with the technology. So I, again, it would be both, but I think you're right, it's important to tease to tease these elements out. Your second question about the shiny and new versus lack of outcomes. Um, I certainly think part of it is that, is that, is that it loses its luster. Um, but I think there are different ways to lose your luster as a new media. One way to lose your luster is to just be so well incorporated into everyday life that it's mundane. You know, you pick up a telephone, you say, hello, that's a script that we all had to learn, but we don't think of it as particularly interesting because it's been so successful, right? And here there's a loss of luster without success. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are other structural elements at play as well that differentiate those two. But I, I'm fascinated by this process of how a new media becomes old. When does it become old? And how does everyone agree, OK, we're done with that? And it's in a way that it can then be rediscovered. So Wi-Fi is radio. But we think Wi-Fi is a very new thing. Radio is not a new thing. How we determine that is not, not at all clear to me. It's one of the things that's inhibited the uh, wider spread of telemedicine in the U.S., the fact that we're <laughs> licensed in a state or a particular state, and it seems to me physicians have been concerned about uh, practicing across straight line, state lines and so forth, and that that may have inhibited more widespread use of telemedicine. Very much so, and thanks for that question. And you may be aware of efforts of telemedical parity that have been developing. And, th and this parity can be set on, on, on different levels. One is that um, you know, one could think about the, uh, the early work of Bird and Crane in, in showing that, yes, you know, if you use this camera setting, you can detect lesions in the conjunctiva at just the level that you could in person. That that's one way of showing parity, that these two things are similar enough. Um, there's another level of parity, which is um, understanding whether a telemedical visit can be billed at the same rate <laughs> that an in-person visit will. And, and this has been a, 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 a substantial problem for the field of telemedicine. It still is. And it's, it, that is one of many problems that have been solved differently in different jurisdictions. Because of course, you know, the, the, the structure of governance in our country gives regulation of medical practice to the states. Even though there are elements of interstate practice, for example, you know, claims of efficacy of a drug that are, that are, that are given to the federal government, right? So there's, there are several different legislative fixes to try and equate or, or, or create parity across all of the different systems by which telemedicine is reimbursed or by which licensing permits or doesn't permit a practitioner in one state to, you know, I guess this is an extension of your question. You know, I was just um, mentioning to, to, to Rick earlier that I, I unadvisedly gave up my Massachusetts medical license when I moved <laughs> to Baltimore. And I, I still regret that. It was a mistake. But, um, but what would happen if I tried to see a patient telemedically um, who was here in Boston now? Well, that, that would immediately raise a jurisdictional problem. I could then apply for a Massachusetts medical license again. Hopefully, you know, the Massachusetts Medical Society would have me back, but I don't want to take that for granted. And, and yet, even if I did that, that would be a financial burden and an administrative burden as well. So there's these multiple levels of 
concerns with parity, they still don't get at this last bit, which is that as much as we have compiled different forms of evidence for the, um, the similarity and the efficiency of telemedicine, there's very little showing the long-term outcomes, right? And this gets back to the second part of Alicia's question, that as much as Bird and Cranin and these other pilot studies could show that actually the medical practice looked pretty much the same either way, they couldn't say, but see if we, when we introduce this technology, we reduce health disparities. And that, that data really hasn't been produced yet. And so it, there's these different scales of parity that I think get involved in concerns of telemedicine. And these larger scale ones haven't been resolved yet at all. Thanks for that question. I have a question. I was at a conference once where they talked about the WHO distributing um, tele telephone um, iPhones mm -hmm. to third world pay people that had no local medical care. Have you heard about that? That they studied their level of health care escalated because they tele they FaceTimed to other tribes miles and miles away, breast lesions, um, throat lesions, etc. And without any kind of instruction, they just self taught themselves to do this uh, peer to peer. Have you heard about that at all? So I, I'm not sure I know the exact study that you're referring to, but I have, I, I ha, I, I'd love to know more about it. I have definitely come across, I mean, th this field of M health and global health, both through the World Health Organization and Gates Foundation and other um, multilateral and, and, uh, and NGO-funded work um, has been substantial. And I guess this gets back to the first question, which is that this talk is in no way a, a sneer at telemedicine or a sense that it could never work or it would never work because I think that there are, there are many examples in which these communications technologies, in fact, in which all of the communications technologies that I'm developing in this project have made substantial differences, um, life and death differences, chronic access differences in, in the lives of individual patients. My, my concern here is more when the, 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 the broader social promise of a collective investment in what these systems can do is or is not actually lived out. Um, but to answer your question, as an anthropologist in Drexel University, Vincent Duclos, who's studying exactly this topic, and doing really, really remarkable ethnographic work describing um, both the successes and failures of various M Health initiatives, because on some level there's a technological enthusiasm there which is not always met, but also, as you're pointing out, the capacity for surprising unintended uses of these technological platforms as users take them and make them into something different that actually address questions of health in a lateral way. The analogy I would give here is Ben Scooter's comments on how um, patients and families found new purposes in the television at linking in a lot of communications, which may have, which was not at all on the radar of what they thought they were doing when they set up to build these linkages, and which could arguably be really quite important for mental health as well, right? So there's, an, there's, a, there's a key element of how we study technologies that allows for the potential that users change technologies, and it's very important to follow where they go. But thank you for that. So you mentioned um, the epithet of Big Brother watching over MD. Is there, in your research, have you found much commentary on Big Brother watching over patients and any ethical concerns in respect of privacy, confidentiality, and so on? Yes, certainly concerns for privacy course across all electronic media as they're brought into medicine. And we can take this back to the introduction with the telephone and the problem of the party line. So when you are saying things over a party line, you have no confidence that it's private. And yet, if you need to divulge urgently private information to the physician, what do you do with that? And I think from that point moving forward, whether we're looking at um, concerns that, that develop in terms of uh, a, one, one of the projects, um, I, I mentioned a NASA-funded project. This is a project that was called STARPAC, and it stands for Space Technology Applied to Rural Papago Advanced Healthcare, and it took place in what was then the Papago Reservation, now the Tono Otham um, Reservation in southwestern Arizona. And this is something which effectively NASA was developing the medical bay for what ultimately became the space shuttle. And they needed, it, they needed a test in a human population. And so this prototype medical bay was stuffed inside of a Winnebago and was driven around the Tono Otham Reservation, picking up sick Indians who were then served as proxy astronauts, but also received medical care as well at the same time. And I mention this case because one of the concerns that kept on being related among the Tono Otham at the time was a concern that somehow what would happen with their image, especially if 
uh, they were undergoing a, a, a breast exam, a, a pelvic exam. What, what happens with very sensitive visual information about one's body when it's just being transmitted into the ether? And many of the Tonotum, um, several accounts related a concern that there was a, there was a rumor that their, their images of their bodies were then being broadcast in a movie theater in downtown Tucson. Um, <laughs> And this, to, to, to my, you know, I, I found nothing to back this up. This seems to be a rumor. And yet, nonetheless, it was a concern of, uh, so I think we have to take rumors seriously as historians, right? So what are the meanings beh behind that particular um, concern? And this is a harder form of material to get at, right? And yet, I think, I think in each of these instances, we can find substantial concerns with, with privacy and with that loss of control of the intimacy of the physical exam on the patient's side. Um, it's already hard enough to entrust it to a relative stranger who you meet in the clinic. It's much harder to have it then broadcast widely. Yeah. Oh, there's one question in the back. Hi, you hinted several times at the collapse of these experimental projects um, taking place because of a lack of funding. But could you say more specifically why the funding collapsed? Who made those decisions? What organizations had been funding them who decided not to? And, and, and why did they make that decision? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think a short answer is, is that when we hit the early 80s, we, we, ha we, have, we have a very different approach to funding and governance in the health sector under Reagan. I don't want to blame it all on Reagan, but I want to say that there's, there's a moment in which an expansive sense of possibility of how you build um, technologically driven health bureaucracies in the 1970s encounters a very different fiscal reality in the early 1980s. And um, again, it's hard for me to assess how much of this has to do with the shift in, in, the, in the political climate, right? And how that relates to funding, and how much of it relates to uh, you know, the point earlier that that this is no longer seen as the new technology to be to be developed. But what I'm really tracking are public funds, and these are and this is something that is to be differentiated with the regrowth of telemedicine in the 1990s, which happens as largely, at least in the United States, largely private ventures, and and the way in which telemedical ventures are privately capitalized in the 1990s, and then extend that private capitalization extends into the 2000s, I think is a legacy that we need to confront with how we understand the limitations of the forms of telemedicine we're dealing with today. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for your questions. I really, really appreciate it.